a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, I'm chairing this lecture um, in place of um, your chair, uh, Sarah, who um, is here, but um, uh, thought she might be a bit late due to a meeting. So I'm particularly pleased to, to um, be introducing Philip Alexander uh, for uh, a number of reasons. Um, the first of which, of course, is his, his huge eminence. It's a privilege to have him speaking to us. Secondly, a very old, he is a very old dear friend. And thirdly, a good friend of our society who has rescued us from many a tight corner in Manchester. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and fourthly, um, he is a wonderful lecturer, as you will soon discover for yourselves. So it's a real treat. Um, I believe I I'm supposed to just tell you how a few things are going to work with us, um, though you are mostly familiar with them. I think you're all muted. Um, we love it if you keep your um, picture video on so that there's a sense of participation, but obviously um, if you do need to switch it off, just click on the video tab. Um, now, if you think we're going to have questions, Philip, that's okay, is it? After yes, the yes. So if you think of questions or discussion points, you can put them on the chat during the lecture. Um, and um, you can, uh, I think, address them either to everybody or to me as I'll be scooping them up afterwards. And depending on how many there are, I will tr may try to invite people to utter their own questions or I will mediate them. I suspect there may be rather a lot of questions. I should also say the, sex, the session is already being recorded or will be, I'm not sure quite what's going on with the technology. It will be in due course available on our website, first actually on the closed section for members, others will have to wait, uh, the general public. Um, and also, uh, I'm asked to remind you to check out our website for previous lectures. And perhaps at this point, I should also um, remind you there are many courses, of course, on our charitable giving at the, uh, for our charitable giving at the moment, some extremely acute and de indeed desperate. Uh, but um, educational cultural charities like us do go on. We rely on membership fees and generous donations, which have been forthcoming through the two years of COVID. We are very, very grateful. Um, it helps us with our general our program, our grants to students, and um, uh, to help them going on going to Israel to dig or do other archaeological things and to publish our wonderful peer-reviewed journal Strata, whose editor, one of whose editors I see here, David Jacobson. So um, if you're a member, you get a free copy of Strata and all sorts of other goodies, and you will be invited to our Jubilee celebrations, our Diamond Jubilee celebrations at the British Academy coming up in May. This is an advance notice. Members will shortly be getting their invitation from Sheila. So if there's no other reason to join up. There will be a wonderful party plus the Richard Barnett Memorial Lecture by Martin Goodman. Please join us. Back now to the business of the evening and to our speaker uh, who is going to talk to us on Did the Rabbis Write Down the Mishnah? Orality and Writing in the Jewish World of Late Antiquity. I'm particularly pleased about the subject because it is where material evidence that we deal in as an archaeological society intersects with, um, the, uh, with the world of um, literature. Uh, so extremely important uh, and something in, on which Philip has reflected for very many years from many points of view. I have here on my desk a wonderful big fat volume which of studies in honor of Philip S. Alexander edited by George Brooke, one of our former 
uh, committee members and still a great supporter, and Renata Smith, who's published just a few years ago, a wonderful volume. And at the back, we have Philip's many, pa many pages of Philip's bibliography. And you will see, for example, that among other things, he co-edited with Martin Goodman, a very important book published by um, under the Proceedings of the British Academy Auspices in 2010, Rabbinic Texts and the History of Late Roman Palestine. So that's a historical take on um, some of these texts. He has published one, one or more of the uh, DJD uh, volumes co-edited with um, Geza Vermesh. He has written on books um, edited um, uh, the Targumim, the Targum to Lamentations, and to uh, and to um, uh, the Song of Songs, and also on Midrashecha Rabba. Is it a book or articles, Philip? Uh, many yeah, other things. Um, I should also just tell you that. Uh, Philip is a, a fellow of the British Academy. He's Emeritus Professor of Post-Biblical Jewish Literature at the University of Manchester. Uh, he taught Jewish studies at Manchester and Oxford, is a former president of the Oxford Centre for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, former president of the British Association for Jewish Studies, and um, currently also in relation to manuscripts has done a lot of work with the uh, Library of Chester Cathedral and published some very interesting exhibition catalogues. <laughs> I, will own, I, I must end by saying that quite simply, Philip knows about everything. So do not put questions on everything into the chat, but if you do, I can assure you, he would be able to answer them. Uh, over to you, Philip. Well, thank you, Tessa, for your too kind introduction. Um, but uh, it's a great pleasure to speak again to the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society. I haven't spoken to the London the headquarters, as it were, for many years, uh, but I did help out with my good friend Joe Dweck's uh, extension of the AI, the Anglo-Israel in Manchester. So without more ado, let me turn to my presentation. Anthony, can you bring up a share screen and operate the uh yeah so just um just if you can i'm just trying to find the relevant slideshow yep there we are so we want um there we are there we go Lovely. So I will, I will ask you, um, like the chief medical officer, you know, of the UK, uh, next slide, please, Anthony, because I'm not controlling these. When I was asked if I, if I had something that would interest the society, I thought I would give a paper based on research I have just published in the new Brill Encyclopedia of Jewish Book Cultures. I was asked by the editors of that work if I would do a survey of Jewish book culture in the period of the Talmud. That is to say roughly the first to the eighth century CE. This is something I'm very interested in and it feeds into a lifelong passion of mine, Hebrew manuscripts. One of my big projects at the moment is to finish off the catalog of the manuscripts in Hebrew script in the John Rylands Library, Manchester, most of which belonged to the great Jewish scholar Moses Gaster, who played quite a role in Jewish life in this country and in the Zionist movement in the first half of the 20th century. Since Purim is upon us and Hag Sameach to everyone, I wonder if I might just take a few moments to share with you a recent Purim related discovery made in the Rylands by my excellent assistant, Dr. Sophia Buddha. It is of an 18th century manuscript of a Purim play. And here it is on screen. <laughs> 
Now, the script is clearly Hebrew, but what language is it in? And I doubt if you can, it's big enough for you to even attempt to, to work it out. The rubrics and stage directions are in Hebrew, but the play itself is in Judeo-Provençal, Judeo-Occitan, the language spoken by Jews in southern France in the late Middle Ages and early modern times. A Roman script version of this play was printed in Paris in the 19th century, but this appears to be the only known manuscript version. And there are things in our manuscript which are not in the printed text. This may well be the autograph. From the rubric, rubrics, it looks as if the play was performed by the yeshiva botters and was a community event. It is making discoveries like this that keeps me working on manuscripts. But to return to the subject in hand, Jewish book culture in the Talmudic era may seem a rather dry academic subject of little interest outside of circles of specialists. So let me try and convince you just how important it is. It is something any educated Jew should know about. I think we can all agree that the Jewish literature produced in the Talmudic era is of enormous info, importance for Judaism and Jewish culture. It would be no exaggeration to say that it forms the bedrock of Jewish religion and Jewish culture. It includes not only the two Talmuds, the Yerushalmi and the Bavli, but also the Mishnah, which is incorporated into the Talmuds, the Tosefta, a sort of second edition of the Mishnah, and a host of Midrashim, particularly on the Torah. As I say, the influence of this literature on the shaping of the Jewish mind and the Jewish worldview can hardly be overestimated. It attests to an enormous creative spirit. It is vast, and yet there is a deep underlying coherence to its worldview. It, is a, it was the product of the rabbinic movement and specifically of the rabbinic houses of study, the Bate Midrash, the yeshivas of today's parlance. Yet we know remarkably little as to how it was composed and to how it was transmitted. One problem is that although this literature was composed in late antiquity, the period between the first and eighth century CE It, the, 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 the literature was composed in the, that period, yet all the copies we have of these works are medieval. Here is the most important manuscript of the Talmudic, of the, of the foundational document of the Talmudic corpus, the famous Kaufman manuscript in Budapest. Next slide, Anthony. So there's a page from the famous Kaufman a manuscript of the Mishnah, uh, Budapest, 11th to the 12th century. Um, this is, so the, the Mishnah itself was composed around 200, was compiled around 200, but this manuscript is from nine, ten, nine, um, nine or 10 centuries later. So we, have, we haven't any of the texts that we know were composed in that period in contemporary manuscripts. Now, some would really would argue that there is really no problem here because the tradition itself tells us how this literature came into being and was transmitted in late antiquity. It was composed, so the traditional story goes, orally, and it was transmitted orally. There came a time, however, around the ninth century when there was a danger because of the political and social conditions of the time that the literature, which was being carried in the memories of scholars and students and Tanaim, professional repeaters, might get lost. And so it was decided in the end that it was kosher to write it down. And this is when we begin to get our first manuscripts. 
if we express skepticism as to whether it is credible that the Talmud or even the Mishnah, given its size and complexity, could have been transmitted orally from generation to generation over hundreds of years, and could even have been orally composed. So com composition and transmission are two quite separate issues. If we raise this skepticism on this, we are often assured that they were, and instances usually cited of Talmudic geniuses who learned the whole Torah by heart, the whole Talmud by heart. Now, I have no doubt that prodigious feats of memorizing the Talmud are well attested. I had a learned rabbinical friend some years ago in Manchester who seemed to have extraordinary recall of the Bavli. If I could vaguely remember a passage which I wanted to look at, I would recite to him what I could remember. He would look thoughtful of a bit, uh, for a bit and then reply, oh, it's Brachot, Daf 26, side B, and it's the top three lines of the text. He was, of course, recalling the Vilna edition. Now, there are arguments to support this idea of the oral composition and the oral transmission of the classic rabbinic texts of late antiquity. First and foremost is the insistence of the Talmud itself that it shouldn't be written down or transmitted in writing. The Talmud insists on this in a number of places. Slide three, please, Anthony. And here is one of them, Bavli Gitin 60b. And what it says, you will see, is Devarim Shebiktav Iata Rashai Omran Al Peh, Devarim Sheba Al Peh Iata Rashai Le Omran Bichtav. Deve Rabbi Yishmael Tana Ele Ele Ata Kotev, the E Ata Kotev Halachot. So this kind of statement is repeated quite a few times in rabbinic literature, and I've listed on the bottom there some of the other occurrences of this particular tradition. The reason for this insistence that the uh, Mishnah and the Talmud and the related text should not be written down is because they belong to the oral Torah in contrast to the written Torah. The written Torah is identical with the text in the Sefer Torah in Shul, neither more nor less. In other words, it does not include the vowels or the accents nor the rest of the traditional apparatus of commentary, Mishnah and Talmud, which elucidates the written Torah and applies it. The oral Torah gives the authoritative interpretation of the written Torah and is closely bound up with it, a point which is beautifully symbolized by the public reading of Torah in Shul, in which the reader supplies from tradition the vowels and accents which make the written Torah intelligible. Every public reading of Torah is a celebration of the marriage of the written and the oral Torah. Nevertheless, the two Torahs are distinct and should be kept distinct. And this is why the oral Torah should not be written down. Reasons are advanced, which it is claimed suggest that this injunction was observed. Observed. We never hear of a written copy of the Mishnah or any other classic rabbinic text being quoted from a written text in a session of the Beit Midrash. The only written text that was occasionally introduced or that was permitted to be introduced was the Sefer Torah. For tradition, the scholars relied either on their own memories or the memories of traditional memorizers known as Tanaim. The total absence of any manuscripts of the Mishnah or Talmud from the Talmudic period, it is suggested, supports this. If these had existed, they would have been rightly prized, and it is unlikely that they would have totally vanished. 
there are no clear references to such written copies of Mishnah and Talmud, even in the Gaonic period, the period after the Talmud. Rabbinic society, it is argued, was a fundamentally oral culture. The Jews were indeed a people of the book, but that book was one book, the Sefer Torah, the, the rest of their religious culture was carried orally, was transmitted orally. So that's uh, attempt to summarize what would be seen as a very traditional view about the composition and transmission of the um, classic rabbinic literature, the Talmud and cognate texts. Now, I want to argue against this traditional view, though it has been vigorously reasserted recently by the eminent Israeli Talmudic scholar, Yaakov Zussman. I will deploy a number of arguments. Firstly, I will argue that rabbinic culture in late antiquity was more of a written culture than is usually supposed. The evidence for this comes both from the archaeological record and from the testimonies to the use of writing in Talmudic literature itself. Rabbinic society had at its disposal the means to draft in writing the key rabbinic texts and to use writing to help transmit those texts to posterity. Secondly, I will argue that the traditional understanding of the injunctions against writing down the oral Torah is misleading, to say the least. The rabbis have been treated, the injunctions have been treated as absolute and universally observed when they were probably limited in scope and maybe at times observed more in the breach. Finally, I will argue that there are a number of cases where Talmudic literature itself seems to allude to written texts in circulation of at least some parts of the oral Torah, cases which have, I feel, been somewhat glossed over or ignored. Now, to get through all this would be a tall order in the time available, so I will, so I will be selective and hopefully manage to outline my case. Let's begin with the archeological evidence for writing in rabbinic society in the Talmudic period. We have to concede at the outset that this at first sight is very meager. The period from roughly 100 to 800 is something of a paleographic dark ages. But this is partly because it happens to be bookended, if you will excuse the pun, by two outstanding collections of Jewish manuscripts the Dead Sea Scrolls from the Second Temple period and the Cairo Geniza from the Middle Ages. Next slide, Anthony, please. And there is a representation of Qumran and a representation of the Ben Ezra Synagogue. I say surprisingly rich, sorry, I've jumped, <laughs> I've jumped a bit. So despite the fact that we've got this big collection in the early middle, beginning in the early age, middle ages from Ben Ezra synagogue and the big collection from Qumran, um, the bit in between looks very, very thin and meager in terms of evidence. But if we take our eyes for the moment off those collections, Dead Sea Scrolls and the Geniza, then the evidence is not so negligible. And we should note that one, the one archaeological context from the period, which has been reasonably well preserved, the caves in the vicinity of the Dead Sea associated with the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 to 135, is surprisingly rich in written material. It contained copies of bits of Tanakh letters, some from Bar Kokhba himself, personal documents, contracts, etc including personal archives, such as the papers of the doughty Jewish lady Babata. Slide five, uh, next slide, Anthony. There is her document registering her ownership of four date orchards as one of the, the documents um, from her archive. 
I say surprisingly rich because this was not a normal Jewish community. It was made up of Jewish refugees hiding out in caves from the Romans. Refugees to boot from a remote rural area of Judea, and yet despite all... No, what? I'm listening to something. Uh, this is coming along the route. Right, okay, I'm listening to something. I'm just telling you. Okay, fine, good, I've got it. Six or six fifteen. I've got it. Fine. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, the, Please mute him. It was not a normal Jewish community. It was made up of Jewish refugees hiding out in caves of the Romans, refugees from a remote rural area of Judea. And yet, yet despite all this, written texts in surprising quantity still played a remarkable pro remarkably prominent role in their lives. In my long article in the Encyclopedia of Jewish Book Cultures, I draw up an inventory of all the surviving written material in Hebrew script from our period. Let me try and summarize my findings here. The inventory falls into two parts, biblical texts and non-biblical texts. First, Bi first Bible. <clears throat> the only Jewish book proper in Hebrew script to survive from late antiquity is the Sefer Torah, and then only in fragments, overwhelmingly from the Torah itself, with a few from the Nach, one and two kings, and Job. They are mainly from scrolls written in skin, broadly following the rules for writing Sifre Torah, found in the Deutero-Talmudic tractates, Sefer Torah and Sofrim. They tend to cluster at the beginning and end of our period, though their dates are disputed among experts. Those from the beginning were found in the Bar Kokhba caves. Those from the end are associated with the earliest levels of the Cairo Geniza. An interesting development of our period seems to have been the emergence of the large Torah scroll, with all five books on the same scroll, which now measured around 30 meters, which is, I think, quite comparable to today's synagogue scrolls. This almost certainly marks an enhanced ritualization of Torah reading in synagogue. These impressive scrolls were probably meant to contrast with the great Bible codices, which increasingly became a feature of Bible reading in churches. The most striking Torah scroll from our period is Ashkar Gilson. Slide, next slide, please, Anthony. Um, it's very broken, but uh, on, on the um, right here is uh, an infrared image of one of the badly damaged um, fragments. And then on the left is a blown up bit of part of the bottom left hand of that fragment. Now, we could spend quite a lot of time looking at this, but broadly speaking, those of you who know Dead Sea Scrolls even, but certainly who know the medieval um, and onwards, uh, Torah scrolls, you Sifrei Torah used in synagogue, will see that there's a lot of features here that um, are found in the later scrolls. Um, for example, the hanging of the, the, the ruling and the hanging of the letters, like, cloth, like uh, clothes from a clothes line, they hang from the line. That's already found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Non-biblical texts. <clears throat> As I've already noted, because the biblical evidence is so sparse, we need to take non-biblical texts in Hebrew script from our period into consideration. These are evidence not only for literacy and the use of writing in their respective communities, but also important for the history of the Hebrew script. And they can illuminate questions regarding layout and formatting, as well as document regional variations in scribal practice, 
since they represent a wider geographical spread than the biblical scrolls, which are from Palestine and Egypt. The non-biblical scrolls fall into a number of distinct groups. Liturgical texts. An example of this is P. Dura 11, a parchment fragment of a liturgical text from Dura Europos and the Euphrates, probably dated no later than 256, when the town and synagogue were destroyed by the Sasanians. And there are other prayer texts in, in uh, Hebrew script. Second, documents. As I have already noted, numerous papyrus documents, Greek, Jewish, Aramaic, Nabataean Aramaic, and Hebrew have been recovered from the Bar Kokhba caves. Letters, contracts, legal de deeds make up the bulk of the material. But we also have, and this is very interesting, Hebrew script papyrus documents from Egypt. The most important perhaps of which is the so-called Cologne Ketubah, dated 417, found at Antinoopolis. This is both in Aramaic and Greek, transliterated into Hebrew script. Then we have inscriptions of two kinds, funerary inscriptions, that is epitaphs, and synagogue inscriptions. Epitaphs are common from all over the Jewish world in late antiquity. The majority are in Greek, but some are in Hebrew Aramaic or a mixture of Hebrew and Greek stroke Latin. Of importance for our present purposes is a group of mid fifth century Aramaic epitaphs from Byzantine Zoora, the biblical Zoar, south of the Dead Sea. In the Western diaspora, Jewish epitaphs are in Greek till the fifth century when Hebrew begins to creep in, and thereafter it increases in frequency and distribution, suggesting greater use of Hebrew as an identity marker by Greek-speaking Jews. One of the earliest locations to display that this pattern of introducing some Hebrew words is Venosa in Southern Italy. Synagogue inscriptions. These were also very common in our period right across the Jewish world. Again, the majority are in Greek, but some are in Hebrew Aramaic. They are often dedicatory in character, recording the generosity of patrons. For our present purposes, the most important of these is the long Hebrew inscription in mosaic about the borders of Eretz Israel, insofar as they relate to the laws of tithing and sabbatical year from the 6th, 7th century synagogue at Rehov near Beit Shan. Next slide, please. I don't know if you can read much of that, but you can see it's a big inscription. And uh, the Hebrew script has been picked out painstakingly in tesserae, in the little tiles. Um, and it's a long inscription about the borders of Eretz Israel. Remarkably, a version of the same document is found in rabbinic literature. For example, in Tosef de Shavid 4.5. The importance of this fact can hardly be overestimated since it establishes a clear link between the archeological record and rabbinic literature. But we should not jump to the conclusion as some do that the synagogue copies were taken from rabbinic sources. More likely, both the synagogue inscriptions and the rabbinic texts were independently copied from a legal document which originated elsewhere, possibly among the priests. Magic. A considerable number of Aramaic and Hebrew written amulets survive from late antiquity. Those from Babylonia in Aramaic are written on unglazed pottery bowls of various shapes and sizes. Hundreds of these so-called incantation bowls, all of them belonging to the Sasanian era, have been discovered. Next slide, please. And here you have a very nice bowl. 
um, as you see, the inscription is written inside the bowl in a spiral, sometimes starting in the middle and working out, and sometimes starting in the, the out and working in. And quite often in the middle, you get these rather fetching looking little demons um, who are obviously being attacked by the inscription. These magic bowls constitute an, a precious resource as yet barely tapped for the study of the Hebrew script in Babylonia in the time of the Babylonian Talmud. They're absolutely um, of the same age as the Babylonian Talmud. They contain occasional quotations from Tanakh, both in Hebrew and Aramaic. Bowl magic does not seem to have been practiced outside Mesopotamia. It is not attested in Palestine or more generally in the West. Their Jewish amulets in Hebrew script tended to be incised on lamellae, that is thin sheets of metal such as copper or lead. The lamella was then folded or rolled and put into some sort of container, which allowed it to be worn on the person. An example of such an amulet is the unusually long text in Palestinian Jewish Aramaic incised on a gold sheet belonging to the collector Benny Wolf of Jerusalem. The spell is designed to ensure victory in court cases. It may date to the sixth, seventh centuries and come from the Balkans. Now, let me try and draw this together. The evidence is meager given that we're covering a period of around 800 years, but it is by no means negligible. Jews were writing in Hebrew script right across the Jewish world, initially in Eretz Israel and Babylon but then increasingly in the Greek-speaking diaspora in the West, where they were also writing extensively in Greek. They were writing on all sorts of materials, skin, papyrus, potsherd, wet clay that was then baked hard, plaster, mosaic, stone, both incised and painted, and sheets of metal. They were writing all sorts of documents, religious texts, Torah scrolls, prayers, legal texts, contracts, ketubot, letters, memoranda, magical incantations and spells. They used reed pens, the kolmos, the Greek kalamos. They used styluses of metal and bone to write on pinakes. I'll come to those in a, these in a moment. Or incise into metal, wet clay and plaster. They used chisels to cut into stone. They used tesserae to do inscriptions in mosaic. In other words, their writing culture was not fundamentally different from the writing culture of the non-Jewish societies that surrounded them. The levels of literacy within Jewish society remains, remain a hotly disputed topic. But by literacy here, we mean basically the ability to read. Writing was a rarer skill and probably only taught for the purposes of acquiring letter recognition. People who could read could probably also, probably also write, but not very well. Writing was left to the sofer or the liblar, the librarius, of whom there were probably, there would probably be at least one in every village. Even great scholars could probably not write very well, though what they wrote would have been had a high degree of accuracy because they understood what they were writing, whereas the Sofer Liblar may not always have understood what he was writing. The degree of competence of the hands in the surviving texts varies greatly from highly pro professional to barely legible scrawls. But as any paleographer will tell you, you have to be careful with scrawls. There are scrawls and scrawls. Some scrawls show very unpracticed hands, like the writing of small children, whereas others, fast, highly cursive hands, on the contrary, show a great deal of practice. I was recently struck by an interesting piece of evidence for levels of literacy in the Aramaic incantation bowls. A significant proportion of these are gibberish, 
there is anyway a lot of abracadabra in magical texts. But these are total gibberish, these bowls, though gibberish in the Hebrew alphabet. Presumably their clients couldn't read. Amulet writers today still try this on, particularly on tourists. My daughter was once given in Egypt a papyrus amulet written in Arabic, but the amulet writer who wrote it out, uh, but the amulet writer who wrote it out for her with a great flourish on the spot wrote complete balderdash. He didn't realize she could read the Arabic, read Arabic. So that's a summary of the archaeological evidence. Now let me come quick, more quickly to the literary evidence. What we can glean from the surviving texts written in our period can be supplemented from classic rabbinic literature itself, which frequently mentions books and writing. We need both kinds of evidence to get the full picture. They supplement each other. The literary evidence is rich and cannot be dealt with fully here. See my encyclopedia article for a fuller survey. I will content myself with a few points here. First, there are quite a number of references to books in rabbinic texts beside Torah scrolls. Next slide, Anthony. And I have listed some of, some of these. So we have Sefer Torah, we have a group of texts known as Svarim Chitzonim, Sifrei Dinim, Sifrei De Agadata, Megillat Ta'anit, Megillat Stroke Sefer Yuhasim, Sefer Hasidim, Megillat Sim Samanim, Megillat Starim, Atomos Stroke Tachrik Shel Barachot, Sifrei Homeros. Yes, I'm absolutely sure this is Books of Homer. The Books of Homer are mentioned in, in uh, rabbinic literature. There's a Sefer Yov Targum, and there's a Sifra stroke Sifre de Rav, which I'll come back to. Second point is the number of terms for a book in rabbinic texts is interesting, suggesting that such written artifacts were not uncommon. The main terms are Sefer, Megillah, Thomas, Kere and Tahri. It should not be missed that in terms of their form, these all suggest a scroll. This is true even of Sefer, even of the term Sefer, which in Hebrew now, of course, is the default word for book in our sense of the term, but originally designated a scroll as in Sefer Torah. This reflects the fact that rabbinic book culture favored the scroll long after the surrounding culture had introduced the codex, that is to say the book in our sense of the term, for all sorts of purposes, including on the part of Christians for highly prestigious Bibles. Christians may have pioneered the widespread use of the codex. And it is not impossible that Jews clung to the scroll as a way of distinguishing themselves from Christians. We can't be sure. One thing we do know is that Jewish book culture really took on, took to the codex for high literary purposes in the end of the, uh, at, in, the in the end, it took to it in the end, in the early Middle Ages, when it was used for the great Masoretic Bible codices, like the Aleppo Codex. Next slide, please. So there is a, a page from the Aleppo Codex. It's a codex, it's a book. And uh, you can see all the Masoretic notes down the sides and top and bottom margins. And that was all more easily done in a codex than in a scroll. And it was one reason why I think that the Masoretes chose the codex and introduced it to Jewish book culture because it suited their um, annotations. But I also think that they chose the codex to distinguish their production from the Torah scroll in synagogue. 
because their codices, their big Masoretic Bibles, magnificent though they are, are not kosher for liturgical use. It seems a bit odd, they're such beautiful and magnificent objects, but they are not kosher for liturgical use because the Torah has to be written from a scroll. The final point I will draw from the literary evidence is the frequent references to note-taking devices. Three of these are noteworthy. First, the tabla, a loan word from the Latin tabula. This is commonly referred to in the scholarly literature as a slat. It was a thin sheet of wood about the size of the modern postcard, which could be written on in ink. The most famous examples of slats are the Vindolanda tablets from the Roman garrison town on Hadrian's Wall known as Vindolanda. Next slide, Anthony. And there we have uh, four of the Vindolanda tablets. You can see they're um, little sheets of wood. They're about the size of a postcard. And you can see the little holes in them um, that, that allowed them to be um, tied together, presumably. It is sometimes implied that slats are a Northern European phenomenon where wood was plentiful and papyrus had to be brought from afar, but they were known to the rabbis. And in fact, there's a nice example in the Bar Kokhba letters. They were commonly used for, used for note taking. Rabbinic literature also refers to the diphtera. Um, the plural that they use is diphtera ot, from the Greek diphthera, a sheet of skin prepared for writing. Several sheets of skin could be laid one on top of the other and stitched down one side to make a little booklet. This was known as membranae in Latin and was typically used for note taking. But most significant for note taking is, was the pincus, plural pincasim or pinaxaot. And this is derived from the Greek pinax. A pinax was typically a wooden board with a rim all around the edge. The area inside the rim was covered in wax and smoothed out. The next slide, please. And there you have a modern reproduction, but very good one, of a pinax, um, a two-leaf pinax. And as you see, it's um, you, it, it can be tied in the middle. And there's the stylus that you write with, pointed at one end for the writing, and then a sort of spatula at the other, which allows you to smooth the wax out if you want to make a correction, or to erase the whole text. So the, the great thing was the pinax could be uh, reused. Several boards could be bound together either along one side to form a sort of wooden codex or concertina fashion. When closed up, the rims of the boards prevented the writing from being rubbed. The pinax was standard equipment for students in which they took their notes. And the fact that they are all over rabbinic literature, I regard as very significant. That they were used to ease the burden on the memory imposed for the composition and transmission of rabbinic tradition seems to me highly likely. And you'll see on the right hand here, a beautiful little relief that's in the um, Landis Museum in Trier of a boy arriving at school and you see him on the right here, carrying in his hand his pinnacles. And the teachers are sitting here with their scrolls. And this teacher, the third from the right, seems to be telling the boy off for being late in school. It's a rather lovely, uh, and the boy is sort of acknowledging um, his lateness, raising his hand. I have covered a lot of ground, I'm nearly finished. I've covered a lot of ground already and I'm conscious that time is moving on. I want to leave some time for discussion. So let me go over my final two arguments very briefly. The first concerns the scope of the injunction not to write down the oral Torah. 
there was clearly such an injunction. I've just shown, 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 shown you one of the texts, but I would argue that it was limited in scope and may not have been all that closely observed. It was clearly ignored in the end. It seems clear that here was some so there was some sort of ban against bringing written copies of the tradition, books of text of the tradition into class. Much of the class was taken up with memorizing and then discussing the tradition. There was nothing odd about this in the context of ancient education. Huge emphasis in Greek schools was also placed on memorizing. There was throughout ancient culture, what my wife in a seminal, seminal article has called skepticism towards the written word. We tend to distrust our memories and like to see things written down in black and white. In ancient culture, the reverse was more or less the case. This had partly to do with economics, books were expensive, but it had even more to do with the fact that the written texts lacked, con the written text lacks context. In learning by heart, you have to learn from a teacher. You recited the tradition after him. You learned from the living voice and that contextualized what you received. The teacher authenticated the tradition and explained it when it needed explanation. Ancient culture was extremely suspicious of autodidacts, self-taught people. And this was often put in the famous maxim, you wouldn't trust yourself to a sea captain who had learned his craft from a book, would you? But none of this meant that there weren't written copies of the tradition around, nor that collections of tradition had not been assembled with the use of writing. But even if they did start out as written collections, those collections would still have been learned off by heart and passed on orally. This leads me to my final point. Namely, that there is some evidence from rabbinic literature itself for the existence of written texts of oral Torah. I will confine myself to only two little bits of evidence. The first is the formula, nefak dak v'ashkach. Next slide, Anthony. Oh, yes, it's, right, it's at the top here. I've transliterated it which means he went out, he examined and found. And this little formula is found um, several times in the Bavli, only in the Bavli. The context is a dispute over the wording of a tradition during a session of the Beit Midrash. It has been suggested the sense is, is that someone went out and consulted a teacher Atana. But a better way of understanding it, I would argue, is to suppose that he left the study hall and consulted a written version of the tradition and then reported back. I could spend some time trying to defend that, but this is my argument. If it was to consult a teacher or Atana, why not bring him back to join the discussion? The written text could not, however, be brought into class. If a written text is envisaged, then it would make sense if it were located on the premises, and we, but we can't be sure. A collection of books, a library of sorts, would probably have been found in the larger Bate Midrash. And again, there's uh, circumstantial evidence for this, allusions and references. So that's the first bit of evidence. This leads me to my final little piece of evidence. And for me, it is a bit of a clincher. It is the frequent references in the Babylonian Talmud to Sifra, Sifre, and Sifre de Veirav, the book, books, and the books of the schoolhouse. This, by the way, is how I understand Sifre de Veirav, and not as it is often translated, the books of the school of Rav, the famous Babylonian scholar. 
The context in which these references occur are lists of texts which an accomplished scholar should have mastered. These include, and I've given the list here, Sifra, Sifre, Sifre de Veirav, and then we get the list Sifra, Sifre, and Halakha, Halachot, Sifra, Sifre, and Tosefta, Halakha, Sifra, Sifre, and Talmud, Halakha, Sifra, Sifre, and Gemara. Now, these look like succinct statements of a curriculum of the Beit Midrash. The names Sifra and Sifre are now, of course, attached to the Halakhic Midrashim. Sifra to the Midrash in Leviticus and Sifre to the Midrashim and Numbers in Deuteronomy. Whether these works in some shape or form are referred to here is open to debate. Though the Israeli scholar Shlomo Na'e has brilliantly demonstrated that the current odd structure of Sifra to Leviticus suggests it was already circulating in writing in written form in antiquity in nine scrolls. But whatever the books referred to are, and I think they're not Torah scrolls, it's not Torah, it is surely indisputable that what the wording indicates is that these texts were circulating in the Beit Midrash in written form. I have clearly not said the last word in this subject, but I hope I have said enough to show you the grounds on which I would challenge the common assumptions about the oral composition and transmission of Talmudic literature, and to demonstrate the importance of seeing these masterpieces of Jewish literature in the context of Jewish book culture in late antiquity. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Philip, for that um, absolutely wonderful, um, astonishing um, uh, uh, survey, and more than a survey, really, because um, there was an argument going all the way through it, and um, you combined so magnificently your knowledge of um, 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 of uh, texts and manuscripts with your in, uh, interest in education, your, uh, 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 which again is, is a lifelong theme, indeed the subject of your festschrift. Brilliant, thank you. And um, may I just kick off because I have two questions, but one of them ties in with Anthony Shepard's question here. Um, Anthony writes, it strikes me as a non-specialist that the Mishnah is much more like a systematic codification of a tradition designed to be written down, or is this way out of the mark? And I was going to ask whether mm. our traditional view doesn't simply encompass a supposed fact that Yehuda Nasi codified in writing the Mishnah. So at the beginning of it all, don't we suppose that from around 200 CE, there was a written text? Uh, that slightly begs the question what the Tosefta <laughs> then was, but okay. So um, two questions around that, um, if, if you... Okay, let me see if I can, I can um, get uh, what you're after. I mean, the... I think that Anthony is he's making a slightly different point, but it, it's related. And that is that he's alluding to the very formulaic structure of the Mishnah. Um, it, it's a remarkable document and it's highly formulaic. And that in itself has been used by Jacob Musner, Jack Musner and others as evidence, both of oral composition and it was designed to be in a form that would make it easy to transmit and memor to memorize and transmit. Now that I would beg to differ on that, because um, the formulaic structure of the mission it does not necessarily help memorization. To give you to give you an example, one of the earliest of these formulaic structures 
is in the so-called houses disputes, the disputes between the house of uh, uh, Hillel and the house of Shammai, the schools of the, of the two, two teachers. And the, the basic structure of that unit is, if X is the case, then the house of Hillel says kosher, non-kosher, or whatever. And the house of Sh uh, Shammai says the opposite, right? And uh, the, the, the ruling is reduced to things like uh, permitted, not permitted, kosher, non-kosher, op op opposites. Now, that's all very well. But my sort of memory would be, I would remember the structure if X is the case. Rabbi X or the house of Hillel says such and such, and the house of Shammai says such and such. But I couldn't for the life of me many times remember which was which. Was Shammai um, non-kosher and Hillel kosher uh, or the other way around? You see. So... Um, there's other ways of explaining this, this extremely formulaic structure. It does not necessarily mean, I would argue, that the text was composed uh, orally and it was composed in a way to make oral transmission um, uh, easier. What it does show though is, and this is I think what Anthony may be uh, um, feeling for the actual wording of the ruling of the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai in this case has not been preserved. It's been reduced to a sort of formulaic position, kosher, non-kosher, um, permitted, not permitted. So what you would call the abscissima verba, the actual ruling as presented in that school has not been preserved. It has been reduced to a formula. So um, I don't think, I don't think it's very clear, um, Tessa, that uh, there must have been a written text of the mission. I can't see how otherwise it could have been composed and transmitted. And this relates to another question I see in the chat. Um, uh, Roberta Harris, how did the rabbis from far from the Middle East le homelands learn the Mishnah and Gemara? Um, if we take the Mishnah first, I don't know where Roberta is, but if we take the Mishnah first, the Mishnah was taken to Babylonia, to Bavel. It was composed in Eretz Israel. It was taken to Babylonia. Now, um, that is the, the transmission that is the most puzzling. Because was it taken purely, purely orally in the memory, memories of some scholars who went from Eretz Israel to, to Babel? We know that there were Babylonian scholars who studied with Judah the prince, Judah, Judah and Asi. So they had the opportunity of learning it off and taking it orally. Or was it taken in writing um, to Babylonia and there made the basis of the rabbinic uh, curriculum? Once you go beyond Babylonia, however, Roberta, and, and you get the mission of being transmitted to Europe, to North Africa, and then beyond, it has already, I think, clearly been written down um, so the, the one, um, the one uh, instance where it is problematic is the transmission from uh, the Galilee, from Eretz Israel, to the uh, Babylonian schools in the, um, in the third century. I hope that, does, does that answer the, the question, Tessa? Oh, I think so. Uh, Roberta, I'm sure, uh, will be happy. Um, uh, unless you want to come back, Roberta. I can't get my grid up at the moment to see everybody. Um, I don't know if that's something to do with my system. I'm sorry about that. So I can't see you all. Um, but um, that's thank you, Philip. Yes. And um, well, we probably should 
unless anything else links up, we have a different kind of a question, but a quick one, Harvey. Did any of the Christian or Muslim philosophers of the early period refer to Mishnah Gemara topics? Um, the Muslim ones would be after, obviously after the uh, early seventh century, after the rise of Islam, but there are references to the Mishnah, of what look like references to the Mishnah in Christian legislation um, by Roman Christian emperors. Um, the novella of Justinian uh, mentions the Deuterosis, which almost certainly is Mishnah. Um, so th 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 there are a few uh, there are a few cases of Christian reference to the mission. Uh, Jerome also refers to um, rabbinic uh, writings. Jerome was the one church father who knew something firsthand about um, the contemporary rabbinic um, literary activity. But there are not much, and I can't for the life of me remember any Muslim references, Arabic references to the mission of it. Somebody may put me right on that. It's, it's, you know, specific references to the Mishnah in early, early Muslim writings. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a long question from BA. Uh, would it help if you read it, Philip? Uh, shall I read it out? I probably yeah. Should. If you read, if you read yes. it out, yes. Do you think the concept of oral Torah originated as a strategic apologetic maneuver by the rabbis, an attempt to create a pseudo historical rooting for a massive rabbinical reworking <laughs> of the meaning of the written Torah? If you accept this understanding of the origins of the notion of oral Torah, do you think the notion of oral transmission after 200, including references in the Talmud, was simply an extension, continuation and reinforcement of the earlier strategic ploy, one that was never implemented except in a peripheral way, but rather was always part of an ongoing attempt to create or reinforce a normative statement for rabbinic Judaism by emphasizing its claimed origins with Moses. This is how I would understand the Christian notion of apostolic succession, i.e. as an effort by the proto-Orthodox, in quotes, to validate their understanding uh, and texts. And I wonder if the same holds for the lineage of the rabbis. Well, that's very interesting. Um, that is extremely interesting, and I would say I totally agree. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, the, I think there's a wonderful um, little midrashic tradition in, um, in the midrashi which bear on this and put this point rather nicely. And that is that on the judgment day, the Christians and the Jews and the Jewish people appear before the Holy One, blessed be he. And each of them says, we are Israel. You see, um, how do you know you're Israel? Well, the Christians say we have the Torah. The Jews say we have the Torah. So, so far they're, they're equal. But says the Midrash, the Holy One blessed be he will say, they are the true Israel who have my mysteries. And what are God's mysteries? His mysteries are the Mishnah. And those mysteries are, are, are kept in oral form. The Christians did not have the Mishnah. They couldn't have it because they would have had to access it orally by going and studying in the yeshivas. So there, and this proves the, the true genealogy, the true lineage of the, the Jewish people, because they're the ones with God's mysteries. That's found in a late Midrash and uh, Tanhoma and uh, other places. So the the point here that it was a that had a polemical side to it, the insistence on the oral Torah as being as important as the written Torah. 
and giving the true interpretation of the oral Torah. And you could only access that oral Torah if you studied in the right schools with the right teachers who had studied all the way back in an unbroken tradition to Moshe Rabbeinu himself. Um, that was definitely an apologetic uh, polemical position. It was a dogma which couldn't be proved, couldn't be disproved, but it really couldn't be proved. Um, and, um, but I think the point I would make is that they did try to enact that dogma to some degree. They didn't just assert it and ignore it. They did try to enact it to some degree by insisting that within the yeshivas, within the Bate Midrash, when you were discussing the oral Torah, you did not discuss it or produce a written text of it. So I would basically accept uh, the, the, the burden of that, that, long, that long comment. Right, thank you for, uh, again, an interesting answer to David Jacobson. Surely the Dead Sea Scrolls provide us with some clues about the writing down of oral tradition. We have a fair amount of commentaries on biblical books among the scrolls. These uh, on biblical books among the scrolls. These seem to have started in oral form and were then written down. Um, so, uh, Qumran Pesha taking us even further back. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, what is, I think it's very, it's very right and proper, David, um, that uh, to, to draw the contrast between the lack of writing down of the tradition in the rabbinic movement, the rabbinic schools, and the, the no hesitation whatsoever, apparently in writing down the tradition in the, the Qumran community, which I, I hold as a scene. Um, and that really plays up, again, the point I've just been making, that there probably is an apologetic, polemic, deliberate um, choice on the part of the rabbis to play up orality within their schools, uh, which was quite different to the... Um, the, the practices of the Essenes at Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So um, what is interesting is that they still made a very strong distinction, I think, though it's not ob so obvious from the texts themselves, between what was tradition and what was written Torah. There, I think that they did have a canon of Torah, and this uh, I argue a lot uh, with my good friend George Brooke on this, that at Qumran they did have a canon of Torah, which was identical to the one that was observed later in, in uh, Judaism, the Torah Nevi'im Ketuvim, they had that, so that they could distinguish between the Hebrew book of Jubilees which was a, um, a kind of retelling of the book of Genesis in Hebrew, they could distinguish between that as tradition and the actual text, written text of the Torah, which was given to uh, Moses and Sinai. We could get into a big debate about this, but I still think they made that distinction despite what a lot of my colleagues would say. But the rabbis kept the distinction clear between tradition and um, written, between oral Torah and written Torah, by insisting you keep the oral Torah or oral and you keep the written Torah written. And that connects uh, in a way with Moshe Klein's question. Are there differences between texts composed to be read and texts composed to be recited? Yes, so an interesting question that. Um, I think the short answer is that there are. I mean, some texts are clearly uh, composed to be read aloud and recited. And the most obvious case of, in, uh, of that would be poetry. Um, 
up until very recently in history, I think um, few people would have dreamt of reading poetry silently. In fact, few people would have uh, read any text silently in antiquity. Um, the emergence of silent reading uh, is a very recent phenomenon in history. Um, but whether you would uh, then style your text in a way uh, differently if you were envisaging it being recited aloud than if you were imagining it being read silently, um, I think you probably would, but it would be very hard to put your, um, to put your finger on that. And right, thank you. And Lindsay Taylor Goodharts, how would you comment on the work of Martin Jaffe and Elizabeth Shanks Alexander? No relation, I believe. <laughs> no. <laughs> the uh, orality of rabbinic literature, which uses orality studies. So, um, some theory. Uh, yes, um, I'm. I'm very. Uh, I know both the, these scholars' writings, and um, uh, they're both very good. Uh, but I'm, I'm particularly close to Martin Jaffe's work. I think he's got it spot on in many ways about what, what orality is, is doing in, in, rabbini in uh, rabbinic texts. He's written some excellent stuff on it, um, including his book, what was it, Torah of the Mouth, mm. which analyzes... Um, I strongly recommend that book. It's excellent. Elizabeth Shanks Alexander, no relation. Um, she's the daughter, I think, of Herschel Shanks. And oh. I, think, I think the Alexander bit must be her, her husband's uh, name. She, she took his name. And I think it was her doctorate. Um, I think, from what I remember of it, it's a very thorough piece of work. She too much accepts the tradition that I am arguing against. She's too uh, accepting of it for my liking. But again, it's a very, um, it's a very fine book. And it's one, of the, it's one of the best books on the subject that appears. It's about 10 years old now, 15 years old. But you also, um, Lindsay, uh, allude to the fact that there's a huge theoretical literature on orality, um, on how uh, texts can be orally composed and orally transmitted and so on, um, going all the way back to uh, the study of epic, uh, epics and so on. And that literature, I think, is very relevant to the study of the rabbinic orality problem. There's a lot can be derived from it that helps to, to guide us in our thinking. I didn't allude to it because it's, it's, a, whole, it's a, whole new, um, a whole new field. I only skimmed the surface of a lot of stuff there, which is theoretical. But if you want one book, read Martin Jaffe. And then um, Anthony Shepard has come back. One point of information, both his points take us to the um, uh, diaspora. Uh, perhaps some um, grist or mill. Philip Ray, large Torah scrolls, the fourth century Sardis synagogue has a very large marble reading desk, if that's what it is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then Anthony says lower down, how did rabbinic teaching get communicated to the Greek speaking diaspora, if at all? Ah, okay. well, I mean, the large reading desk, I think, is that's very interesting. I'd, um, uh, I, I don't know enough, of, I can't remember enough about the Sardis synagogue, but I'll take his word for it. And that's very interesting. If it is the reading, uh, reading desk, and it's very large, then it could well be evidence that they'd gone over to the large Taurus scroll. Um, it's a very significant development, the large Taurus scroll. 
So um, that would be very... It's a slightly mysterious object in that uh, it looks very like an altar and the church, uh, the synagogue's very like a basilica. An altar it clearly isn't. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's uh, assumed to be a reading desk, has eagles on it, which is... Uh, ah. Uh, but there you go. Right, um, right. Uh, so thank you, um, Anthony. And um, Gary Rensberg, Moshe Barasher has observed that many textual variants in the Mishnah manuscripts must have arisen in an oral transmission. For example, yes. a nav, his eyes versus a nav, I suppose, grape berry. Yes, there yes, are more yes. of these instances than, say, examples of a bet cuff and resh dalit interchange, yep. uh, i.e. written ones. What yep. would you please comment? Yeah, hello, Gary. <laughs> nice to see. Nice to see you, um, or to, to, to hear from you. Yes, I mean, I, it's an interesting observation that, but um, I don't think it's decisive one way or another, because the way that um, if you take Greek manuscripts, um, where we know they, they would have been copying from a written text, you also find similar oral mm. um, variations like that, because you know it depends how the scribe does the copying. They read the line um, in the text, and then they they turn their their eyes to the, the the manuscript that they're copying, and they repeat it. And in the the course of that, they they could well uh, make that oral. Um, you know that oral uh, mistake so it's, it's i mean it, i don't need to tell you it's a standard type of variant uh, ocular and oral uh vari variants um but uh, gary where's where's this moshe barasher um text that you're referring to i'm trying to think um it was an article in the journal Hebrew Studies, I believe. I can email it to you. That would be great because I'm, I vaguely remember something about it. But it, it is relevant, but it do, I don't think it necessarily um, swings, it, swings the argument one way or the other, would be what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a little longer, two more questions. Um, after which we should begin to think about wrapping it up and uh, letting you recover, Philip. Drew Longacre, when we look at the tombstones from Byzantine Zara, the majority were written in rather crude, non-professional scripts. I've suggested, this is the questioner, uh, that this could be an indication of a fair amount of non-scribal literacy. How do you think the quality of scripts in this and the larger corpus fits into your thesis? Yes, uh, uh, nice to, to hear from you, uh, Drew. I know, I know the text, the, the article, I think I know the article that you, where you argue this. Um, they are, uh, the, so, the Zohara inscriptions are very crude. I don't know whether you have any theory as to how they were made, um, they're quite small, actually, and I think they must have been made with a reed pen, oddly enough. Um, but the, the letter shapes are quite, are quite, quite crude. Um, yeah. there's, a, a, there's a huge range of, of different uh, competences in the hands. And I would have thought that those ones were not at the bottom end of competence and might have been um, in affected by the difficult medium that, that it was being written on. I've never, I've never actually seen them in the, uh, the actual stones themselves. And I don't know how rough the surface of the stone is um, nor have I dis uh, am I clear what they were written with. Um, I don't think it could have been a brush 
I don't know of anyone using brush to make uh, letter shapes um, uh, like that outside of China. Um, so it may the, the the crudeness of the letter shapes may have something to do with the in, implement being used, being um, used, and also the roughness of the the surface of the stone. But it's an interesting an interesting question. And uh, the last question in the chat from B A. Um, following up, actually, a comment. Uh, Following up on Dr. Alexander's response to my question, if in fact the primary objective of the rabbis and their lineage was to render their approach normative, then I would expect the same motivation would have led them to write down their materials as much as possible. <laughs> Plus the same motivation that led the rabbis to claim orality would make them in practice wish to develop a large body of written literature. <laughs> <laughs> well, interesting. I mean, the simple fact is they did write it down in the end. Um, and uh, from, you know, the ninth century onwards, um, the texts are being, the, the rabbinic texts are being written on codices, very interestingly. And of course, if you go into a yeshiva today, they're, they're sitting with their Talmud, the written Talmuds open in front of them, recite, reciting it. And, uh, but even when they did start to write it down, the normal first move in studying it was to learn it off, to, to recite it, to chant it, to recite it off, and then begin to argue and discuss about it. No. And in fact, if I may, may add, I mean, I neither know nor should know what goes on in a yeshiva really, but from today, but from what one reads, there's still a premium. Uh, I mean, you get a terrific advantage if you know vast tracts by heart. You can do the kinds of intellectual operations that they want to do of rapid citation yes. of parallels which you could never do by roaming around a written text however yeah. well you knew yeah. it unless yeah. you had a digital search now you do of course but you wouldn't yeah. have had um so there must be still a, an interesting different interplay between um oral approaches and and having the text yeah um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah um and uh oh um Well, I think we will, um, if uh, Philip conclude there, you've given us a, a wealth of, of um, attention and answers on top of a, a very rich and full lecture. So thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you above all to our speaker. And if we could do a round of applause in whatever way or thumbs up um, and... Um, Good night and yes, Chag Sameach indeed. Chag Sameach. Bye bye.